If we look at the quandary that we find ourselves in today, these are huge issues for society to grapple with. People are rising up and panicking. They recognize that this can't go on. That's a good thing that that's happening, but it's going to be imperative that these people and these movements look for and accept guidance from indigenous people who know how to adapt and respond to a changing environment. Humans have excluded fire from this natural system and have created unnatural conditions as a result. Fire is our relation and we need to work with fire. Indigenous people of this country, for a very long time, they've been managing the land, using cultural knowledge, using traditional stories, doing prescribed fire, using what they know is good for their places. At least for the last thousand years, up to 200 years ago, there was a very intensive Native American fire management regime in place. Fire suppression and exclusion with first colonization, then there was a very strong emphasis on suppressing all fires. And then with increasing climatic conditions of temperatures, drought stress, very dry forest, how does traditional knowledge guide an adaptive process to now learn to live with fire? The Forest Service is starting to, you know, hear the land screaming back at you, everything's burning up, hey, you gotta do something. You can't just tell us that we can't do what we've been doing here for a long time, because it's gonna mess everything up. And the more prescribed fire we get on the ground around our communities, the safer we are. Elders can still come in here and collect those resources right there and they can get in here and teach the younger generations the traditional practices and that knowledge never gets lost. Fire is many things to us but it is not our enemy and we use it. It is a tool. I think a Western approach has really looked at how we can dictate and control systems. Indigenous or a native approach is how we fit into that system and how we utilize that system. So the two approaches are are very, very different. As far as Indian people, Buffalo, and in, in all our history, they were, you know, our economy, they were our food, our clothing. Then killed to near extinction. These animals here are my passion of bringing these animals back, returning that part of our culture. You know, you think about the buffalo being the biggest climate change adapter as an animal in the world. A buffalo is so different than a cow so much more resilient. Not only are they healthy, you know, for eating, but also for our spirituality and a big part of our culture of just making us whole again. Conventional agriculture does everything by mechanics. You have 14-row planters, herbicide applications, pesticide applications. A lot of that runs off and contaminates things downstream. With Hopi agriculture, we don't use any of that stuff. Hopi is one of the very few places I know where we plant corn to fit the environment and not manipulate the environment to fit the corn. Dry land farming means that basically you don't use irrigation. These are like super seeds, you know, they're, they're very tough, you know, they're like us and so they, they survive like us. The title of my presentation is, is Indigenous Agricultural Knowledge, Barriers, Policy and Integration and Outreach. This corn is rare because you can put it down two feet deep and it'll still come up. We've been in this part of the country for thousands and thousands of years. We know how to manage natural resources. Agroforestry is far from a new idea, it's actually the old idea. The United States, through the illegal takeover of Hawaii, undermined Hawaii's agricultural capacity. Hawaii moved into this sugarcane monocrop production. With the old systems where you had more diverse crops, so you've got other crops coming in at different times of the year. Food forests survive impacts during the Great Storm, where agricultural fields and two-dimensional lines do not. A lot of our problems with climate change is because we've modified the environment so much. The benefits of this forest is these complete intact elder communities. Well, the federal government felt that the best way for the Menominees to assimilate into the rest of society was to become farmers. The Menominees being woodland people, their real desire was to keep their land forested. 
Right now, currently, there's more standing volume of timber on the forest now than there, there was back in 1854. We can't operate like the capitalistic society does. It was always the land first. The fact that we're still here today, in any form, is a testament to adaptation and resilience.